The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Van der Sickel Ennui is dispersed as British battleships take to the air with black zeppelins of unknown origin. January contest, even a homo habilis wise guy and an australopithecine diva could figure out how to enter to win a signed Lee and Miller book cover blow-up poster. Plus part 43 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. This time we have an interview with a relatively new Bain author, Frank Chadwick. Frank is well known in the board gaming world as a designer. He was among the original writers for the Traveler role-playing game, and he's the creator of classic Civil War game House Divided. Most importantly for our purposes, however, back in 1989, he was the designer of the seminal steampunk game, Space 1889. Frank was there at the start of what has become basically a literary subgenre and a cultural phenomenon. Some of y'all will have read Frank's debut novel, How Dark the World Becomes. That book is straight-up science fiction, with a great tough guy narrator, a human who does not accept second-class status in a galaxy dominated by aliens. How Dark the World Becomes is available in trade paperback at the moment and will be out in mass market paperback next month. But the book we'll talk about this time with Frank is, well, sort of a sideways steampunk novel. It's got some science fiction justification that's pretty cool. Anyway, the book is The Forever Engine. I can't help but think this is really a perfect steampunk novel. It's got flying battleships, lots of zeppelins, and oppressively foggy London and lots of that staple of steampunk chic cool goggles. Thank you, Cokie Daniel. No problem, Daddy. I like steampunk. So we'll talk with Frank in a moment, but first, Bain Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey and Bain Editorial Assistant Christopher Cifani join me for the news. We mentioned that the Forever Engine is now out in trade paperback. Also just out this fine January is a new entry in the Ring of Fire universe created by Eric Flint. This one is by Ivor Cooper. Is it Ivor P. Cooper? Mm -hmm. Laura? Uh, Ivor P. Cooper. Ivor P. Cooper, a longtime contributor to Eric's various uh, 1632 anthologies. Laura, can you tell us about this one? Sure. This one is something of a departure for the 1632 series. This one goes both east and west, goes west to the coast of South America to start up a new colony and try and do it without the institution of slavery. But their plans go awry when a slave ship lands in search of water. Then novel takes a turn for the east to the shogunate of Japan and trying to get the uh, shogun to end his policy of isolationism and join the rest of the world. So we're we're talking about the New World, uh, America and Japan in the 1632 universe, which is where a town from West Virginia went back in time. Right. That well, sounds fun. Uh, Seas of Fortune is now at booksellers everywhere. We have a January contest that's pretty simple. A child could do it, a child! until the teacher helmet starts to wear off, and then it's like trying to thread a needle with a sledgehammer. Jim. <laughs> Did you just make a geeky Star Trek reference to this Fox Brain episode? No, not me. <laughs> you got to be kidding. Hey, look, it's Bain Editorial Assistant Christopher Chifani. Hello. So, Christopher, can you tell us about the January contest? I sure can. Uh, we've got a great prize this month. It's a signed, post-sized blow-up of the cover of Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Lee Auden universe novel, Trade Secret. Uh, this is on a foam board. It's a really nice poster. Um, and all you have to do to enter the contest is send us an email with your name and the subject line, January Contest. What's the email address? The email address is contest at bain.com. Uh-huh. Contest, C-O-N-T-E-S-T, -E at bain.com. 
Yep, that's right. All right. And the deadline, what is that, Christopher? Uh, the deadline is January 25th of this year. Excellent. By the way, we have a Lee and Miller Omnibus Edition out this month. Can you tell us about that one, Laura? Sure. This one is Volume 2 of a Lee Aiden Universe Constellation. This is 15 short stories that are set in the Lee Aiden Universe that uh, Sharon and Steve wrote when they were in between writing novels. So these fill in the, the gaps in some of the stories. Yeah, and can explore every corner of the Lee Aiden Universe. Uh, we're going to talk to Sharon and Steve later this month. So, lots to check out. 1636, Seas of Fortune, and a Leaden Universe Constellation, Volume 2, are now at booksellers everywhere and at BaneEbooks.com. Check them out. Jim? All these neurons. I, I just can't. Live long and podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Not all who podcast are lost. I'm joined by Bain Editor Emeritus Hank Davis, and we want to welcome Frank Chadwick to the podcast. Hi, Frank. Hi, Frank. Hey, how you doing? Frank Chadwick has designed or written over 100 games and game-related books, and in the science fiction field, he's probably best known for his work on Traveler in Space 1889, those games. He also writes military history, and his Desert Shield Fat book that came out in 1991 reached number one on the New York Times bestseller list, thus making him someone we can always say a number one New York bestseller on the cover of any book that we put out of this. His uh, debut print novel is the science fiction adventure How Dark the World Becomes, uh, which came out last year and was really great. Uh, kind of a noir thriller science fiction novel, adventure novel that's really good. Uh, Frank's latest novel is science fiction, too, of a sort. It's not exactly science fiction, not exactly alternate history, and not exactly steampunk, but a little of all three. The book is The Forever Engine, and it's available at booksellers everywhere now. Frank, uh, The Forever Engine is set in a kind of 1888, two universes over from ours. How much of the setting does it take from your game, uh, Space 1889? Which came first, the book or the game? Oh, the book. The game came first. The game came, uh, what is it? it? came out in 1988, I think. So it's been, it, it came quite a while ago. Um, and the book, the book takes a lot of the setting. Um, although I've, it's been elaborated, uh, over the years. Um, but that's kind of where I started, uh, with Victorian science fiction alternate history. Uh, steampunk. And of course, back then, we didn't have the word steampunk yet. Yeah, you were steampunk before there was any such thing. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, back then it was just plain old Victorian science fiction. Um, it, it, it really draws a lot on that background. What makes, what's different about the Forever Engine, I don't want to get into spoilers or anything, but I mean, this can be pretty obvious from the start, is that the main character is not from that world. He's from our world. Um, how he gets there is part of the story. And, and what the relationship is between our world and theirs is, is in that world, how these two can coexist is, is a large part of the story, too. Um, but the main thing I wanted to do with that is I wanted to be able to um, write it from the point of view of someone who knows our world but doesn't know anything about that, and so it's kind of discovering it all along. I didn't want to have to write it with all the characters the viewpoint characters having all this backstory that the readers don't. So the readers are kind of really right in there with Jack Fargo uh, being thrown into this world and discovering it with him. Yeah, and it gives you an opportunity to lay in a little exposition without seeming like you're uh, you're, you're laying it on thick as well. <laughs> yeah, and it also gets uh, it also gets gives me a chance to look at it kind of with our sensibilities and our sense of humor. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's Jack, there are jokes in there that people in that world won't understand, but of course the readers from our world will. Yeah, there's you can make some sort of uh, that some meta jokes about uh, about steampunk. As a matter of fact, it's it's got some uh, some nice quips in it. Although it's a it's a serious book, it's not a a parody of any sort. Right, it's not a it's a yeah it's very it, it takes the the subject matter very seriously. It takes the world very seriously. I don't personally I don't care much for the more tongue-in-cheek treatments of, um, at least, and that's not to say there's anything wrong with it, but they just don't do anything for me. That's not mm -hmm. what I enjoy. I don't enjoy, um, 
I, I, I don't enjoy it when, when you tell the writer's kind of making fun of his own world. Um, this is meant to be a serious world. Um, it's just not our world. And I think that's true of most alternate history. I mean, that's not that unusual. That's, that's where most alternate history comes from. Well, uh, it's most definitely not a game disguised as a book either. It's It's got a hard-driving story, an excellent hero uh, in Jack, who I, I wish I could be like, except for the, the dead wife part. Um, <laughs> yes, except the, yeah, the dark parts of the soul. But, yeah, um, but I guess that makes him who he is. Um, and you got a great film fatale uh, and a cool villain. Great stuff. Can you set up the story a bit? How does I, I think we can go ahead and say how how Jack Fargo ends up in the world and and uh, what his task is at least at the beginning of the novel. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jack is a, a a former U.S. Army. was a U.S. Army veteran who ten years. And, and so the the story starts a few years in our future. Um, the uh, what year? You should probably take a look at that. But it's uh, 2018 is when the story begins. Jack has left the army for some time. He's gone back to school. He's now a teacher of uh, ancient history at the University of Chicago. And a a, a friend of his from his military days, a uh, a major in the British SAS, brings him to Europe to consult on a project, ostensibly a a cultural resource find, but in fact, um, there's a, a a secret project, a secret weapon project that has instead turned up what appear to be artifacts from the past. They appear to have somehow instead um, broken through time. Um, but the problem is the artifacts they have don't match our history. Um, so, in, in the course of trying to figure out what all this is. Uh, and, and, and trying to get more artifacts, there's a significant accident. Jack's uh, injured, he wakes up at a hospital, but the hospital is in 1888 in England, and uh, it's not our 1888. So he has to... The, the, the suspicion has been that someone has actually meddled with our past, and the past is now changing, and when it when the change ripples through time up to us, it'll wipe our existence out. And so Jack's faced with the problem of figuring out what's been changed, if that is indeed the problem, and then changing it back to save his future. Otherwise, the whole world he came from, all the people he knows, will be replaced by something probably not recognizable, um, certainly not incorporating any of the people that he knows, including his daughter, who he's left behind, and who will be extinguished by this time wave. Um, so that's his goal, is to figure out what's going on, get, figure out where the time was changed, if it was, and what he can do to fix it. And then that incorporates him in all sorts of things that are already going on. Yeah, it's quite a task to take on, to saving the world. Uh, you... Yeah, and it's not one that he ever particularly feels up to himself, but he doesn't have a choice, does he? Right. He's... There's a lot of uh, cool amalgamation of late 19th century politics and movements that you uh, bring in here. Can you explain the politics of England, France, and Germany that, that you've come up with and how they are related to what was actually going on? Sure. The, the uh, English politics are not enormously different than they were. Um, there's a, Although the industrialization is more accelerated, um, by some of the scientific discoveries that have taken place in the alternate, in this alternate world, um, and and what that's what that's led to is a, uh, a, a more of a concentration of wealth in the hands of the aristocracy, and those those of them who've gotten into this rapid industrialization are called the Iron Lords, but they'd be pretty recognizable to someone from the late Victorian era anyway. Um, France, the, the Commune didn't collapse after in 1871 at, at the end of the uh, um, at the end of the uh, Franco-Prussian War, and so the, France was the democratic and social republic of France, and that's had the most effect on politics because it kept England and Germany more aligned, uh, and France also has a lot of espionage. Uh, it, it was involved in a lot of radical movements like the labor movement and the anarchist movement and all sorts of things like that. Um, all those things that were were. Secondary and underground, and and never like the Fabians and et cetera. I suppose. Uh, yeah, the, yeah the, the Fabians and the Fenians are are involved, in, yeah, and some of that stuff kind of sputtered 
in the mid 1800s. There were there were some big crises in the mid 1800s, but then it kind of sputtered out for lack of uh, having any major sponsor. And with the and with the French uh, communalists or the communards uh, backing some of these things, it's kind of got a new lease on life, and uh, it is it is causing more problems than it was then. Uh, Germany is uh, um, it almost exactly where it was historically. We kind of forget how closely aligned Germany was with England until um, Kaiser Wilhelm came to the throne, got rid of Bismarck, and started them on their alternate course that, that diverged them from uh, and, and of course, the 1888, this is just when uh, Wilhelm is, has come to the throne. He's just come to the throne a few months earlier. So um, so that hasn't really had a chance to diverge let, yet. But if anything, Wilhelm will probably is, push, is going to push Germany faster and farther away from Britain um, uh, than, than uh, historically. So but that's kind of that moment that the novel takes place in, is all this stuff is kind of hanging, as to all these alliances uh, are... Everybody's uncertain as to exactly how, uh, well, even 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 in the internal policies of some of these countries like England, there's a lot at stake, and there and it's a it's certainly not a a sure thing that one political movement is going to come out on top of the other. So there's a lot of a lot of back and forth that's not just between countries, but between different factions within these countries. So in France is uh, more the bogeyman for England than than Germany is, and Gabrielle. Uh, your heroine, femme fatale, whatever you want to call her, is uh, is a spy. All of those things, France. yes. Yeah. Um, she's a self admitted spy uh, yes. for the commune, uh, but she's not your normal spy. For one thing, she's got a, a bit of a personality issue, or at least she does for a spy. Can you uh, can you tell us a little about her character? Sure. Uh, and and Gabrielle, I think for me is like the most is the most interesting character in the book. Um, of course, you always have your supporting characters almost always end up being a little bit more interesting than your than your hero because he's just got some constraints on where he's going. But Gabrielle is, um, although it's no longer considered a, a a legitimate diagnosis as of like this year by in the new uh, DSM manual, um, Gabrielle has Asperger's syndrome, and um, it, it's she doesn't. They, have, they don't even know what that is then, but Jack Fargo does, um, and is able to kind of at least let her in on that at some point. Um, but she, she the, her personality is, um, gee, I don't even know how I want to characterize it other than that, but she's certainly... She's kind uh, of like wonderfully naive because she takes everything literally, but yet she's also uh, incredibly intelligent. She understands the uh, all the political stuff that's going on. Yeah, she does, and she she can reason from facts extremely well. Um, and she's incredibly hot, also. <laughs> yeah, she is that too. But um, and she knows how to use a shotgun. Yeah, she knows how to use a shotgun. She has a lever action Winchester Model eighty eight, so um, that's not or eighty seven, so that's not bad. Yeah, um, the woman of my dreams. Nick certainly admires that in her, um, among other things. But yeah, she has she has a, a hard time. Determining people's emotional, the, the, understanding the emotional content in situations. Um, so when people are being sarcastic, um, she doesn't really understand that. Um, there's there's a lot of emotional nuances in conversations that escape her, um, but her reasoning from facts is impeccable. Yeah, and this leads to, I mean, again, the, there's it's not a humorous book, but there's a lot of humanity and cleverness in the book that. Uh, that I think comes through, and it, and it comes, and it this leads to her situation leads to some some wonderful misunderstandings, at least with um, with some of the people who are not. Uh, yeah, there are some there are some great scenes. Uh, it, I think, well, if I do say so myself, I mean, there's scenes I really enjoyed writing, um, but particularly the scene when, uh, and this is later on in the book, and we just when they get to it, they'll understand. But this when Gordon is very angry and knocks on her door. Uh, Gordon is one of the British characters, and, and there's, a, I think, a very nice exchange where they're trying to figure out what it is they're saying, and the words, it, 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 it's, but there are some very nice, I think, charming uh, misunderstandings that take place, and it's not a funny book, but there are certainly some funny, funny parts in it, I, I meant there to be, um, because that's the way life is, you know, sure, people, absolutely. Uh, even when things are, you know, desperately serious, um, 
people still have a sense of humor unless they're unless they're crazy. Well, and it's good stuff. Uh, finally, uh, Nikola Tesla. We don't want to give too much away, but he's central in the book. Uh, what is it about Tesla that seems to fit in so well with the late nineteenth century uh, vision of science that uh, steampunk likes so much? And he seems to define that sort of steampunk sensibility, doesn't he? He does. He does. And I think the late nineteenth century was kind of the last time um, that you could have the traditional the term that's now out of style, the polymath, uh, the, the the person who's master, who can really master. Um, multiple fields um, at the same time of, of pretty intense uh, scientific study. I mean, now the science, uh, the volume of scientific knowledge that we have has grown so much it's very difficult for someone to even master a very broad part of one field. But Tesla was a brilliant electrical engineer. He was maybe a brilliant theorist, but there's no question he was a brilliant electrical engineer. Um, and then, and then, of course, the other thing about him was he was so weird. <laughs> you know, I mean, he was so odd. Um, one of his characteristics, and I don't even mention this in the book, but one of his characteristics was that he had such an incredible visual memory that he could build intricate machines without doing blueprints of them. That he could, he could maintain the precise measurements in his head, machine things from that, and they would actually fit together and work. And I mean, that's just it's, just, it's just amazing to think about that, that someone could have that, and I mean, a, a complete three-dimensional visualization with precision measurements of parts, fabricate that and have it work. Um, so, I mean, he, he's a, an extraordinary guy. Um, a lot of the stuff that he speculated about, especially towards the end of his life, we really don't know what he meant because a lot of the things he didn't write down. He talked about things he was thinking about. He had this thing, the dynamic theory of gravity. Everybody's got a different theory as to what he meant by his dynamic theory of gravity. But um, you can certainly interpret some of this stuff as, um, if, if you squint at it and turn your head a little bit, as to being very related to some of the things in physics today. Um, he was ambiguous enough that Maybe that's one of the reasons that in fiction he's so popular too. Is some of his late theoretical work is so ambiguous that you can you can interpret a lot of different ways and come pretty close to some things in physics now. And I I I talk about uh, one of the things he talked about as being very similar to the Higgs field um, and related to the Higgs boson. Uh, it, it, what, what he would call it, I think he called it force bearing ether or something. Um, so um, it, there's a lot of reasons why. Tesla is just a fascinating character, and he's such um, such a uh, so interesting to writers of fiction, I think, as well, because he's he had that. such an imagination himself and envisioned so much more than he actually uh, was able to accomplish with, with the technology they had at the time. Yeah, he's kind of a, a Prospero figure. Um, well, let's let's talk about some of your wonderful uh, pseudoscience technology, and um, it's. It's not really pseudo, since we are in an alternate reality, but you, you do try to be rigorous in the book and work it all out. Tell us about Liftwood. How do, what is it? How does it work? It's, it's a great thing in the book. I mean, they don't exactly know how it works, but they have some theories. Um, Liftwood is a, a wood that, that grows on Mars. It doesn't grow here. It grows just on very specific places on Mars. Mars has been visited by ether flyers since 1888. Um, and it's it, when plain, it it cancels the um, it, it cancels the effect of gravity direct in direct nominally it cancels the effect of gravity direct uh, directly opposite the axis of the the, uh, the, the toward the center of, of 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 mass. What it actually appears to do is um, it it doesn't change gravity. Instead, it alters mo the momentum of objects. It exchanges momentum so that the, me the momentum remains the same in the system, uh, but it, it takes momentum from the surrounding air and, and, and transfers it to the uh, um, to, to whatever vessel it is. Yeah, and, so, and so it provides a sort of repulsion. It, it provides a lift. It's yeah. a lift wood. And you can, for instance, have a flying battleship. <laughs> 
Yes, you can, and they do. Um, yes. and on, uh, so they have flying ships using liftwood. That, now, there aren't a lot of them because there's not a lot of liftwood. It's rare. They're still getting it from Mars. No one has been able to cultivate it artificially. So there's a very limited amount of it. It hasn't taken over. But it certainly caused an aeronautic revolution. And so there's a lot of flying vessels in this, a lot of hydrogen-powered and hot air balloons. Um, I was wondering how ma- historically how many uh, things like zeppelins and uh, uh, were there in 1890, 1887. It was just at the dawn of that. I mean, they were they were they weren't commercially feasible yet. Um, the zeppelins just beginning to work on this stuff. Um, the uh, you're right on the verge of having large powered uh, airships. Um, so we can we we crank that up a bit in the in this in this world it just comes a little quicker. I mean it's not like the uh, the technology wasn't there, the science wasn't there. It was more of an engineering issue than science, and, and then just working out the kinks in it. So that comes a little earlier. They have a little bit better data processing. The Babbage uh, the Babbage uh, engine actually is uh, has been manufactured, and they're improving it. The, so you're getting better data processing, you have these kind of steam-powered flying ships with lots of mahogany and brass, and, uh, and a lot of Zeppelins. What, um, the Forever Engine, and we don't want to give too much away, but um, give us a hint at what it might be and, and why it might be a bad thing. Um, well, yeah, I don't want to give too much away either. It's, um, but it is a... Um, a potential perpetual motion machine, except there is no such thing as perpetual motion. Even in this world. Yeah. Um, so instead, what it may do uh, is rob the Earth of its of its rotational momentum, and, uh, of its rev- of, of its orbital momentum, and turn that into power. So basically, turn it, it turns momentum into in, into uh, uh, into electrical energy. Um, so, but if so, then that has a chance of slowing the Earth's orbit, and then the Earth gets into a tighter orbit and heats up and everything else. That would be a bad thing. That would be a bad thing. So we don't <laughs> yes. perpetual motion machines, um, while they uh, while they seem wonderful, still don't eat, work even in in alternate universes, probably. Yeah. No, and and kind of the point that Jack makes is that um, no matter what the laws of your universe, there's still only so much stuff in it. You know, you can move it around in different ways, maybe, but um, it's pretty tough to um, envision an alternate universe that has anything to do with ours, where conservation of matter, energy, and momentum doesn't hold. Uh, otherwise, how do you even define the, ener- the, the universe without without some bedrock principles like that? So, so right, the laws of conservation of energy, uh, matter, and momentum are still in play, and so. Uh, this machine, uh, the, the energy doesn't come from nowhere, and uh, where it does come from could have some, uh, some catastrophic effects for the Earth. Well, tell us about, uh, to get more down to Earth, uh, tell us um, about some of the weapons in the books. You know that a lot of Bane readers, we have quite a few gun nerds out there. Um, <laughs> and Fargo eventually packs a, a Webley revolver, I believe, and uh, Gabrielle's got that. Is it a vintage Winchester? I mean, it's not a vintage. It's, it's a Winchester Model 87, I think, which is the uh, lever action 12 gauge shotgun uh, with a five round tubular magazine. It looks like a big honking Winchester rifle, um, but it was a real, it's a, you know, it's a real weapon. There, there's still people around, um, but it was probably the closest thing at that time to a pump action shotgun. Um, yes, that's her, that's her weapon of choice. Uh, Jack ends up with a Webley. I don't know that he's ever really happy with it until he ends up instead. Uh, with with an Enfield, um, and he's really unhappy with that. It, it, it almost gets him killed. It's the Enfield that um, has a... They're both break-open revolvers. And it's kind of the old-fashioned break But the Enfield, he just, it's described in the books having a, like a complicated lever underneath. Well, what that was was the Enfield had this really kind of fancy shell ejector that when you opened the, 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 the thing halfway, the shell ejectors only came out far enough to release the shells that were expended. If you hadn't fired a bullet and the bullet was still in there, it would stay in the cylinder. So you could just like empty the bullets that were expended and just reload those for a partial reload. Or you could do it all the way and, and eject everything. So, but to get that, 
that, you've got this kind of complicated lever system underneath, which, of course, ends up when he's out you know, thrashing around in a, in a muddy stream, getting all jammed up and can't get it reloaded. Kind of tough. Desperately, to... wants, his, desperately wants his Webley back then. Yeah. Well, and the British uh, floating warship, the Intrepid, or Intrepid, um, you, how did you develop what kind of armaments a battleship that flies through the air might pack? It's based upon the naval armament at the time, for, uh, probably about a cru- of, of a of a light cruiser. Um, it's got um, it's got I think four point seven inch rapid fire, a couple four point seven inch rapid fires, which were just coming in. They were really uh, at the time probably the the killer rapid fire weapon. Um, the uh, they have uh, they have uh, Nordenfeld volley guns. Uh, for automatic weapons, they don't—they're just about to get the maxim, but that's—they—they they, they say that they're due for maxims on their next reset. But in the meantime, they have, I think, eight-barrel Nordenfelds. Which, if anyone's—if if you've ever seen the movie uh, *Cartoon*, did you ever see that movie? It's hey. one of the few films where I've seen they actually have Nordenfelds. Which I've probably seen it. It was a uh, rapid I've seen weapon. It, it was like about forty years. Barrels were all in a row, like on a board. And you move a lever back and forth, and it fires all the barrels at once, and then you pull the thing back, and it reloads bullets at all of them, and you fire it. And you kind of move this crank hmm. back and forward. Not round and round, but just a lever backwards and forward, and it kind of splats all the bullets at the same time. It sounds like a volley uh, that's gun. The Nordenfeld, uh, yeah. That's the Nordenfeld volley gun. Uh, so that's what they have for an automatic weapon. Yeah. Um, so it's, it is all the actual stuff that the, British, that the Royal Navy was running around with at that time. So um, Fargo and uh, Jack and Gabrielle are, are trekking toward the stronghold of a, an anarcho-syndicalist um, known as the Old Man of the Mountain after uh, the Middle Eastern assassin, although he's not that historical figure. Um, right, he just based, he, he, he uses the name based on that to strike okay. fear. And he's in Serbia. Uh, now, World War I got started over an, anar- an anarchist killing a, an Austro-Hungarian duke, right? Um, that's right, in Serbia. What what is was going on during during those years there in the Balkans that, that produced this sort of wild west feel? Oh, um, a lot of new governments, a lot of weak governments, and a lot of people with and, and a lot of boundaries drawn without much attention paid to how they were living there. So uh, it was just became an area where everybody had a Right. <laughs> you know, against somebody, uh, against some gov- against their own government, or against the government next door. So we're talking about um, we were talking about the Balkans, right? What's everybody's problem in the Balkans in this period, huh? And my take, my understanding of what went on there is that uh, they've made all these new nations fairly fairly quickly, mostly out of the the disintegration of the uh, of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and the boundaries were drawn without much attention to um, what the people living there wanted. So you have lots of uh, different ethnic groups that feel they should be in some other country, um, lots of uh, ethnic groups that think they should be in charge instead of the people that are, uh, a lot of religious differences, and some of these per- are, you know, persist in the Balkans uh, to today. Um, yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like the 1990s in the Balkans. I mean, it, it, the, some of this stuff just it takes a long, long time to go away. Um, Africa's still got problems today from the you know, crazy boundaries that you know, it just kind of, the continent just got divided up with no attention at all to, you know, who went with what internally. It was just, uh, so when you, when you start just kind of drawing lines on maps like this, you always end up with everybody with a grudge against somebody. Um, and that's kind of what you have going on in the Balkans here. I mean, everybody's, um, there's just enormous amounts of antagonisms, uh, and, and, and bruised feelings and senses of injury, uh, that, that need to be regressed or failing that avenged. Um, and so it, it becomes a, you know, a difficult place. And yeah, there's a series of Balkan wars fought before World War I. And then in World War One, it, 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 even those don't really get the job done, and eventually World War One just uh, really bubbles out of all this problem. Not entirely, but to a, but that's certainly the, the flashpoint for World War One was uh, 
all this difficulty as well. Well, it's a good place for uh, an evil mastermind to set up a headquarters, that's for sure. <laughs> it, it is, and the fact that a lot of these, government, these new governments were pretty weak in terms of their control of their own interior, um, they were not strong governments for the most part, or, or particularly well-organized governments with a... Um, with a tradition of an administrative system that would kind of keep everything going. So if you were a strong man out in the countryside, you could get away with a lot, and you could kind of get yourself a lot of privacy. Um, and so, yes, it is a, a, a pretty good place where it, 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 it's, it's ideal for evil masterminds. Yeah. That's right. Well, you make, uh, you make Fargo a professor of ancient Persia. Um, and I believe this is a special interest of yours as well, uh, as somebody who studies history. Who is the woman explorer that Gabrielle accompanied in the book? Um, she's real, isn't she? Yes, she is. She's uh, Jill of Boy. Um, she and her husband, uh, I forget his name. I shouldn't. I mean, he's, he's a very famous uh, archaeologist as well. Um, were the ones who did the first expedition to Susa, the city of Susa, the, the, the uh, Jill of Boy expedition to Susiana, um, where the, some of the original uh, Architecture and artifacts of the Persian Empire were discovered in the 18, early 1880s. Um, and, and, and she, she was actually a photographer. She, an archaeologist in her own right, but she was also the uh, photographer. And she took extensive photographs of a lot of the architecture that's now been degraded by the elements, um, or vandalism. And some of the only records we have of this stuff are, are her photographs. So she's, there's a whole, there's a wing in the loop named after her with a lot of the stuff they brought back from Susiana. But she was also an extraordinary, extraordinary person. Um, she and her husband married in, eight, in 1870, on the, right at the beginning of the Franco-Prussian War. Her husband was mobilized and went off to fight. And so she put on a uniform, went with him, and fought through the whole war as a man. Wow. And, and spent the rest of her life traveling everywhere, dressed as a man with her husband. Um, and really did pretty much anything guys did. At the time, there were sumptuary laws in France still, where women were prohibited by law from dressing as men. And the, and the, and the, uh, the French Parliament specifically exempted her <laughs> from those laws. Um, so she, that, that alone kind of makes her an extraordinary person. And uh, I, I relate maybe the most, most famous incident that, uh, from the, Expedition, the Susiana expedition was when, uh, she was guarding some supplies. There was no one else around, but she had a revolver and probably, I think probably a Spencer carbine, but it was a, it was a, uh, um, it was probably an eight shot, um, uh, weapon because they were, she was confronted by, I think, oh, ten Persian bandits. And there's a very famous woodcut of her that shows her with her revolver held up at them, and she's holding in her other hand her, her rifle. Uh, and the and the caption is, um, "I have 14 balls at your disposal. Go back, go and find four more friends." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, she really was an amazing person. Um, and I mean, the, the, one of the things I think that draws people so much to this period is that. Um, it's a period full of these remarkable eccentric people. I mean, it's, it's a period we think of as um, norm, this enormous pressure to conform, um, a very kind of fixed, stultified approach to society and, and, and behavior and norms. And yet, or maybe because of that, there are these extraordinary eccentrics um, who, uh, who really break all these, uh, all these, uh, all these molds, and uh, uh, and maybe because it was in so way, in a lot of ways, such a restrictive society, they almost allowed the you know, the real wild eccentrics and kind of lionized them and treasured them as uh, their necessary escape valve or something. Well, um, what else are you working on these days? Uh, are you uh, working on the book? I hope. Uh, I am. I am. I'm working on the sequel to. Uh, how Dark the World Becomes. Um, tentative title is Come the Revolution, which will mean something to people who've, who've uh, already read How Dark the World Becomes, but maybe, but, but maybe it's a different revolution than they think. We'll see. Um, but it, it picks up with Sasha two years after uh, the end of How Dark the World Becomes. 
Well, if you read um, the Forever Engine, oh, listener, and uh, you, you like that character of Jack, uh, Sasha is kind of a, I don't know, he's a a darker, more beat-up Jack, or I don't know how you would, but he's... Certainly he's, comes from a different place. Um, yeah. The uh, He comes, of course, Sasha is uh, an orphan, a, a really, effectively a feral orphan, who grew up and somehow survived in an environment that's very, is very difficult to survive, but he, he managed to survive. Uh, and, Among uh, very mean aliens. <laughs> and uh, became a pretty successful criminal. And, uh, I mean, as thugs go, he's a pretty successful thug, but uh, at a certain point, um, became at least tired. Now, I don't know that tired is certainly right, but it's not all there is to say about how he feels about his life. Um, but he feels, but he's certainly trapped into the life he's in, and he finds a, he finds a way out, a potential way out that actually ends up um, having a, a pretty enormous effect on the whole future of uh, that galactic civilization he's part of. That's obviously not a, a alternate history novel. That How Dark the World Becomes is set. Um, it's set about a hundred and a little over a hundred years in our future. But there's alien races we've been contacted. There's a, a, a multiple star, a star spanning civilization there that humans are now part of. Yeah, it's a, it's a really fun book. Uh, but um, if what about the Forever Engine? Um, are there other areas you'd like to explore in the world of uh, of that book? It seems so rich. There there have to be a lot of uh, stories there that you've been thinking of. Uh, absolutely. Um, and now, which way we go, I'm not sure. Now, I, I'll tell you the and, and anybody. I don't know if we've mentioned, but there's also the short story, uh, "Murder of the Hawks Leaguer Ost," which is uh, that's right uh, available free from the website, which is a prequel. To the Forever Engine. It takes place about a year earlier, um, and it's uh, it concentrates on Gabrielle. It's her first assignment as a spy, um, so you see her just getting started there, and then a, a year later in the Forever Engine, you, you, you meet her as an established spy. Um, but the uh, I, I, I she's awfully fun to write about, and so, and so is Jack. Um, but there's also a character Renfrew. Um, I won't say much more about it except to say that he's also a very fun character. He and Gabrielle, uh, I, I've just been thinking the last, I don't know that I'm going to do anything with this, so maybe we shouldn't say this, but I mean, one of the things I've been kicking around is the idea of, um, some, some mystery stories, uh, with the detective duo being Renfrew and Gabrielle, because they, they are kind of fun together. Um, Sure, that might work. Renfrew is for, really Renfrew is a historical uh, figure. If anybody wants to figure out who he is, what's that? Renfrew is a historical figure. If anybody wants to figure out who who you were talking about, yes, and I don't want to spoil it because it's a little. It's always a little bit of the reveal is a little fun in. Uh, oh yeah, both it, the stories. It's a great deal of fun in the book as well. Yeah, um, the. Uh, and, and of course, all the references to Dwight, Illinois, are absolutely true in the book. I mean, that's and that's one of the reasons I, I, I knew this alternate identity for him is all that stuff takes place. The, the stuff that's mentioned in the book is in the 1860s when he took place up at Dwight, just up the road from here. So, yeah, so I think that could be fun. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, the alternate history mystery stories. I'm not sure if, if it'll if it how much legs it has, but but it would certainly be fun to try one or two um, with Renfrew and Gabrielle as a duo trying to solve various crimes of a of political and social importance in this world. Um, so I might try something. I'm 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 going to turn that around in my head. But there's also some bigger stories that would involve Jack more that would take place. Um, really, as a follow-on to the Forever Edge. Well, I think you you need to take him to Mars. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. But the, the next the next book in the series has to be on Mars. Yeah. Well, the the current book is the Forever Engine. It's a wonderful uh, mix of steampunk and science fiction, and it is by Frank Chadwick. It's at booksellers everywhere. Frank, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thanks very much. I really enjoyed it. And now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. 
Thank you, Cokie Daniel. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible for free for 30 days. Okay, here's what has gone before. After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's star kingdom of Manticore has entered into a simmering low-level conflict with the ancient aristocratic Solarian League. The Solarian League is crumbling, and at the edge of its empire, rebellion is brewing. The Solarian Office of Frontier Security is in charge of keeping the peace on the edge of empire. Brutal tactics and puppet dictatorships are par for the course for the OFS. Rebels opposed to the oppressive regimes can't hope to match the military might of the OFS without outside aid. Royal Manticore and Navy Admiral Michelle Hinka, Countess Goldpeak, commands the RMN forces in the nearby Talbot Quadrant. Goldpeak is sympathetic to the rebels, but is looking for the right place to strike a blow on their behalf. In the Mobius system, the Sollies are attempting to put down rebellion against the Solarian-supported puppet government. But now Royal Manticore and Navy Commodore Sir Ivers Terakov has arrived, along with a sizable detachment of Goldpeak's fleet. Terakov wastes no time. He blasts to smithereens the Sali encroachers, and now he's determined to rescue the battered resistance forces and crush the brutal Sali puppet government of Mobius once and for all. Here is part 43 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. Chapter 32 I wish we knew what he wants to talk about, Mackenzie Graham groused as she locked the door behind them. Then she and Indiana headed down the rickety stairs. Their apartment building's elevator was on the fritz again, from the sixth floor. I'm not crazy about unexpected emergency meetings. We'll find out why he's here soon enough, Indiana pointed out, keeping a cautious eye peeled. The landings were none too well lit, and muggings weren't unheard of, even inside apartment complexes, especially not here on the other side of town, where so many historical buildings from Seraphim's early days remained in use. Most of those older buildings had been constructed using natural materials and without countergraph capability. They were smaller, built closer to the ground than the later towers, and easier to break into, and they'd never boasted the security systems that were part of the city's newer structures. They were also fire traps, but on the limited plus side, there were fewer public security cameras on this side of town, and the rundown tenements offered their inhabitants a much higher degree of anonymity. And given what had happened to Indiana and Mackenzie's father— and the complete destruction of the family's financial fortunes, not even the Skaggs were likely to find it remarkable that they'd been reduced to such miserable quarters. The light was out again on the second-floor landing, Indiana noticed, when they reached the third floor, and he slid his right hand casually into his pants pocket as they made the turn and started on down. If anyone was going to try anything, it should happen just about now. The two men lurking in the landing shadows had obviously done this before. They came out of the darkness in a concerted attack, rushing the brother and sister from both sides, and he saw the dull gleam of a knife. His right hand came out of his pocket in a practiced move. His thumb pressed a button. The collapsible baton extended instantly to its full seventy centimeters, even as his left arm swept Mackenzie behind him. "'Give me your wall! Ah!' the one with the knife snarled only to break off with a scream as Indiana brought the weighted baton down. It was a whip-crack strike, a quick, powerful flick of the wrist rather than a full-armed blow, and he recovered from it instantly. He stepped towards the knife-wielder, not away from him, as the injured mugger clutched his own shattered wrist and hunched forward. The second man had targeted Mackenzie, but she wasn't where he'd expected her to be, thanks to her brother's shove, and Indiana's move took him just out of the mugger's reach as well. The second attacker shouted an obscenity and turned towards Indiana, one hand going back over his shoulder. Indiana saw the blackjack against the third-floor landing light, but he had plans of his own, and the other man collapsed with a hoarse, whistling scream as the rigid baton's rounded tip slammed into his solar plexus like a rapier. 
The second man went down, writhing in agony, trying desperately to breathe. It didn't look like he was going to have much luck with that, given the serious internal injuries he'd probably just suffered, a corner of Indiana's mind reflected. At the moment, he had other things to worry about, however, and he turned back to the first mugger. He stood like a swordsman, baton poised, and the broken-wristed attacker gawked at him in disbelief. My sister and I were just leaving. Indiana was amazed at how level his own voice sounded, and the fact that he could actually hear it through the thunder of his pulse. I think your friend needs a doctor, and as far as we're concerned, you can find him one, but I wouldn't advise choosing this building again in the future. The still-standing mugger's mouth dropped open, and Indiana extended his free hand to Mackenzie without ever taking his eyes from the other man. She took it and stepped across the still-spasming, gagging body on the landing. I'll give you five minutes before I call the cops, Indiana continued, although God knew he had no intention of doing anything of the sort. I think you should both be gone by then, don't you? He nodded to the other man, then followed Mackenzie down the remaining stairs without ever turning his back on the mugger until they reached the vestibule. Then he glanced at his sister and shook his head as he saw the compact automatic pistol sliding back into her pocket. Idiot, she said, shaking her own head. There were two of them, Indy. You did notice that, didn't you? What did you think you were doing taking both of them on by yourself? It seemed like the thing to do at the time, he told her mildly, collapsing the baton and opening the apartment building's front door for her with his left hand. Only because you suddenly decided to go on a testosterone jag. I'm not exactly a little girl anymore, you know. No, you're not. And you're a better shot than I am, too, Indiana acknowledged. On the other hand, it occurred to me that shooting someone full of holes in our own building might not be the best way to keep a low profile. The Cherubim PD hates filling out the paperwork on dead bodies, but they do investigate them, you know even on our side of town, when firearms are involved, at least. Mackenzie had opened her mouth. Now she closed it again. After a moment, she even nodded in agreement. Point taken, she said after a moment, because Indiana was right. The Cherubim police didn't give a damn how many muggers managed to get themselves killed, and if the one Indiana had dropped was found dead on the landing from blunt force trauma— there probably wouldn't be any investigation at all. Those cops who weren't on the take were too overwhelmed trying to look out for law-abiding citizens to worry about what happened to the capital city's predators, and the ones who were on the take had more profitable things to worry about. But they stood up and took notice when firearms were used, and any case involving them was automatically flagged to Tillman O'Sullivan's Seraphim System Security Police not because the Skaggs cared how many proles slaughtered each other, but because the possession of firearms by private citizens was illegal. That hadn't always been the case, but one of President MacReady's first acts in office had been to amend the system constitution to delete its guarantee of a citizen's right to be armed. After all, they couldn't have all those weapons floating around contributing to the unacceptably high crime rate, now could they? I'm glad you agree. Indiana said with a grin as the two of them stepped out onto the slushy sidewalk. More snow was drifting down, and the east wind felt raw and cutting. Mind you, I'm a little concerned. It's not like you to give up so easily, especially when I'm right. Don't push it, Indy, she said severely, and he chuckled. They walked down the sidewalk to the tram station in the middle of the next block. The public transit system looked as worn out as anything else in Cherubim, and the often vandalized tram car's broken windows made gaping punctuation marks in the colorful, usually obscene graffiti that caparisoned their sides. Despite that, the trams were mechanically reliable, and, unlike a great many other things in the Seraphim system, they actually ran on a reliable schedule. Primarily, Indiana and Mackenzie knew because they were the only means of transportation available to most of the capital's population, and the system's transstellar masters wanted their serfs to get to work on time. The tram was just pulling to a stop as they arrived, 
and Indiana followed Mackenzie aboard. They presented their transit authority passes for scanning and managed to find seats that weren't in a direct draft from one of the broken windows. The tram moved off through the snow and slush, and the brother and sister gazed out at the crowds of poorly dressed, shivering, head-bent pedestrians. There was a lot of foot traffic in Cherubim, even this late and in weather like this. They passed an occasional ground car, but those were few and far between, and the parking spaces which had once been filled to capacity and beyond stood mostly empty. Downtown Cherubim had once been home to a bustling, thriving district composed of privately owned small businesses, restaurants, bookstores, art galleries, boutiques, jewelers, pawn shops, clothiers, and electronics stores. Their owners and operators hadn't been wealthy, perhaps, but they'd made ends meet, and they'd worked for themselves. Now, every other storefront stood empty. Most of those which remained looked run down, worn out, tattered around the edges. Yet here and there, an oasis of well-lit, clean crystal-plast display windows offered gleaming goods for sale. Indiana's eyes hardened as he saw those thriving windows, because there was a reason for their prosperity. They were the ones that belonged to the mayor's friends, or even the president's, the ones whose owners had connections, who didn't have to pay protection to corrupt cops and city council members or to one of the Transteller's local managers. Hell, two-thirds of them didn't even pay city taxes. There's always someone willing to play jackal, he thought bitterly. Always someone willing to go along to get along. They may not be the ones who decided to rape Seraphim in the first place, but they sure as hell don't have any problem squabbling over the scraps and grabbing whatever they can get on the side. And not one of them would dream of raising a hand to do anything about MacReady and her bottom feeders. Mackenzie reached out and squeezed his knee with one hand. He looked at her, and some of the bitterness leached out of his eyes as she smiled sadly at him. She knew exactly what he was thinking, of course. Once upon a time, Bruce Graham had been one of those shopkeepers, until his livelihood had been destroyed by others' corruption. Indiana saw the understanding in that smile, and he smiled back at his sister, patted the hand on his knee, and then turned back to the window. The tram deposited them two corners away from the soup spoon, a restaurant they both liked and which somehow managed to keep its doors open despite its owner's lack of connections. Probably because the place looked like a dump, Indiana reflected, as he and Mackenzie slogged through the last of the slush, stamped their feet clean, and stepped out of the damp, raw cold into the warm, delicious-smelling humidity. The restaurant windows were heavily misted with condensation, and Electa, their favorite server, greeted them as soon as she saw them. Indy, Max, I've got your regular table open. Come on back. The Graham smiled and followed her towards the back of the restaurant. The soup spoon had absolutely no ambiance to recommend it to the better type of customer. The silverware, plates, and bowls were thoroughly mismatched. The tables and booths were worn, and the cheap hollow posters on the walls couldn't hide the fact that they were badly in need of paint and maintenance. Water stains in one corner of the ceiling indicated a leak management hadn't been able to get fixed for almost three months, and the floor really needed to be recovered. But what it lacked in polish and upkeep was more than compensated for by the sense of welcome. It was a warm, friendly place, one whose owners knew the vast majority of their customers by first name, a place where the food might come in mismatched bowls, but the kitchen was spotless. Every dish was just as delicious as it smelled, and the daily special was priced to let honest people wrap themselves around a warm, sustaining meal. Indiana and Mackenzie heard other regulars greeting them by name as they passed, and they smiled and nodded and waved back while they followed Electa to the table in a rear corner. He's been waiting for you. Electa said much more quietly as they walked. She smiled, as if she'd just made a joke. Ben and Alan kept an eye out. They didn't see anyone following him. Indiana nodded, laughing at the joke she hadn't made. Thanks, he said, 
and then nodded to the man called Firebrand as they reached the table. Glad you could make it, he said casually, pulling out Mackenzie's chair and seating her before he sat down himself, facing Firebrand across the tattered-looking checkered tablecloth. I said I'd look forward to trying the menu the next time I was in town, Damien Harahap replied and sniffed deeply. If it tastes as good as it smells, I'll be back, too. I don't think you'll be disappointed, Electa assured him, pulling out her order pad and looking back and forth between the three of them. You guys ready to order yet? They just got here, Harahap protested with a laugh, and she snorted. Hey, it's Thursday. That means Indy here is going to have the clam chowder with a side of hush puppies and coleslaw. Mackenzie's going to have the beef stew over rice, tossed salad with oil and balsamic vinegar dressing, and a side of garlic bread. Coffee for him, hot tea for her. So, that only leaves you. She gave him the challenging grin she would have given any other new customer, and he laughed again and shook his head. Since it's my first time here, why don't you surprise me? What do you recommend? Oh, man, are you letting yourself in for it? Indiana warned him, and Electa whacked him on the shoulder with her order pad. Don't listen to him, she told Harahap. The problem is he doesn't like coconut milk. Coconut milk? Harahap repeated a bit blankly, and she nodded. Yep. You want my advice? You'll have the Masamon curry with duck. And maybe, she eyed him consideringly, in your case, we'll add a little pineapple and some peanuts. Trust me, you'll love it. Well, I do like curry, Harahap admitted honestly in this case, and nodded. All right, sounds good to me. How spicy do you want it, scale of one to ten? Make it a nine. Brave man, Electa laughed. White rice or fried? White. And bring the fish sauce if you have any. All right! Electa beamed at him. Coffee, tea, or water? Tea. And let me have chopsticks, please. Gotcha. Electa waited long enough to top off their water glasses, then disappeared with the order, and Harahap sat back in his chair and looked at Indiana and Mackenzie. I like her he said sincerely, and Mackenzie nodded. So do we, she replied, not mentioning that Electa, the Soup Spoon's owners, and two other members of the wait staff were part of the SIM. There was no need for him to know that. Good place to meet, too, he went on, looking around the restaurant. In most ways, anyway. Lots and lots of ambient noise, people talking loud enough no one's in a good position to hear what anyone else is saying, and a clientele of regulars who recognize a newcomer in a heartbeat. Makes it hard to plant somebody on you, but it's got its downsides, too. He shook his head wryly. Trust me, I got quite a few second glances when I turned up, enough to make any good spy nervous. Don't worry about it, Indiana told him. Harahap cocked an eyebrow at him, and Mackenzie leaned forward slightly in her brother's support. We've been regulars here since before our father was arrested, Firebrand, she told him. People may have wondered who you were when you walked in. In fact, that's one of our better defenses. Nobody in here is real fond of the police, McCready, or the Skags, trust me, but they know the two of us. The fact that you're meeting us here makes you one of them, provisionally at least. Harahap looked at her thoughtfully for a moment, then nodded. Which brings us to the reason you wanted to talk to us in the first place, Mackenzie went on. We didn't expect to be hearing from you again quite this soon. And I didn't expect to be back here quite this soon, he told her, picking up his water glass. He took a sip and grimaced slightly. On the other hand, this isn't the sort of profession where you get to count on reliable schedules. So why this schedule change? Indiana asked. Things are heating up between us and the Sollies, Harahap told him, which was true enough in its own way, assuming he was reading his tea leaves correctly, if not in the sense his listeners might expect. It's not general knowledge out this way yet, but the Sollies sent a fleet, 
over four hundred ships of the wall to take out the manticore system. Indiana's eyes widened in shock and the beginning of dismay, but Harahap shook his head quickly. Didn't work out very well for the Soles, he said with a thin smile. As a matter of fact, Admiral Harrington handed them their asses, if you'll pardon my language, blew the hell out of them and captured every surviving unit. Indiana sat back abruptly, and Mackenzie's eyes brightened. You kicked their asses? Indiana asked. Really? Like they've never been kicked before, Harahap assured him, with a delight which was completely unfeigned. He suspected some of his actual superiors might have preferred for the Mantis' victory to have been just a tad less overwhelming, but that didn't dampen his enthusiasm for seeing the SLN kicked flat on its back one single bit. Even when he'd worked for the Solarian Gendarmerie, Damien Harahap had loathed the Solarian League. It had simply been the best game in town. The brother and sister looked at one another, and he was impressed by how well they controlled their obvious glee. He could see it, sitting across the table from them, but he doubted anyone else could. It's going to be a while yet before anyone else on Seraphim knows about this, he went on, not bothering to mention that the only reason he knew already was that more and more Mason alignment dispatch boats were equipped with the streak drive no one else possessed. When it does, though, the Transtellers are going to be more than a little unhappy, especially since we're busy closing down all the warp termini as well. He chuckled nastily. The bottom's about to fall out of a hell of a lot of the League's interstellar economy, and people like Crestor Interstellar and Mendoza are going to take a hammering. For that matter, the federal government's going to take an incredible beating when so much of its revenue stream goes belly up. Indiana and Mackenzie nodded in understanding, and he shrugged. The thing is, and the reason I'm here is, that things are moving faster than we ever really anticipated. Which, he reflected, was damned well true. In fact, it was probably as true for a real Manticoran as it was for the alignment at the moment. That means we've got both additional opportunities and additional risks to think about. I can see that. Indiana's expression was thoughtful, his tone cautious. Exactly how does that affect us here in Seraphim, though? I mean, obviously it does, or you wouldn't be here so far ahead of schedule. No, I wouldn't, Harahap acknowledged. First, though, have the weapon shipments gotten through all right? Yeah, Indiana nodded. You took us by surprise getting the first one in here so quickly, but everything's worked like clockwork so far. We've gotten them out of the capital to a secure location, too, and we've started establishing secondary weapons caches now. He shrugged slightly. We're still working out the best way to handle training our people, and I won't pretend we wouldn't like to have more guns to go around, but we're in a lot better shape than I would have believed we could have been a few months ago. Do you have an actual plan to use them? Harahap asked, looking at Mackenzie this time, and she shrugged. We've got a long-range plan, a short-range plan, and at least a dozen contingency plans, she said. What kind of timetable are you looking at? For the long-range plan? She snorted. Try two or three T years. That's not so good, Harahap said. Depends on what you mean by good, she responded. It would take two or three T years, yeah, but we figure the odds of success, even without fleet support from the Star Empire, would be three or four to one. I can see where that would appeal to you, he conceded. On the other hand, a lot of things can change or go wrong in that long, which means odds can shift a lot. So what's the time frame for your short-range plan? Indiana and Mackenzie looked at each other for a moment, then turned back to him. A minimum of 90 tea days, Mackenzie said flatly. A hundred and twenty would be a lot better, and frankly, our chances of success without outside support would suck.
That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 43, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Laura Haywood Corey, Christopher Cefani, Koki Daniel, and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a pair of diamond encrusted goggles and free tickets to an alternate universe Zeppelin cruise to Barsoom, accompanied by Nikola Tesla, H.G. Wells, and Prince Albert in a can. For Frank Chadwick, author of new novel The Forever Engine. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars.